tell me. Ready? Memorex. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Susan DeCastro. Thank you for joining me at the first Ward 4 meeting of 2019. I'm so happy to see a nice crowd. Thanks for coming out on this cold January evening. Let's see. This evening, well before I start this evening, I want to make you aware. In the back of the rooms there are two doors that are red and white. Those are the restrooms. And they're open if you need to use them. Okay. This evening, I, well, I'm going to introduce my three speakers. I'm going to welcome all of you to speak at the end of each of their brief conversations. And then, but first I want to start by saying, I just passed my one year mark as Ward 4 counselor. Thank you, thank you. And what I, what I like to say to people, because everyone asks me, how do you like it? Six days a week, I really like it, and I think I'm making a difference for my constituents and for the city of Brockton. And the seventh day, I wake up and go, what have I done? <laughs> oh my goodness. I've learned so much, but that's been the theme of, of my being a city councilor. Every day I learn something new about the city and about my constituents and about Word 4 that goes to reason. Um, and I wanted you to know that in 2018, I had about 161 calls from constituents. I wasn't able to help everyone, but I helped most everyone, and I listened to everyone. And uh, the topics that I get calls on, by and large, are streets and traffic, crime, street lights, taxes and related, like abatements, neighbors, neighborhoods, um, those are my top, my top topics. Um, and I've tried to help everyone that I can. And unfortunately, this time of year, I'm getting a lot of calls about potholes and our streets and getting our streets paved. And today was my deadline to respond to a letter from our DPW superintendent, which he sent to all the ward counselors asking for a list of streets to be paved. Since, I, since actually I was campaigning for this job, I've been keeping a list of the streets that I get requests for, and it's up to 14 streets. Yet he tells me I can only get one done this year. So I will put in the top one on my street, and then I'm gonna give him a list of four others and hope that maybe there's a little extra money and he'll help me out. Um, but I wanted you to know that I'm always aware of our streets. So far I've had a good experience in War 4 with our highway department when I call and ask for a pothole to be filled, Copeland Street was especially bad in a pothole way last Friday. They come out by the end of the day and our potholes are filled and so I'm very grateful for this kind of help. They've been just super so far this winter. So tonight, I made up this agenda based on topics that I thought we needed to hear about on this cold January evening. Um, Three topics. The first one is going to be crime in Ward 4, especially crime most recently. And I'm very fortunate that the Brockton Police sent Captain Mark Picaro to speak to us. We have some other, Cap or some other Brockton Police here this evening, but he will address this issue, I'm sure, very well. And then the second topic I wanted to talk about is what's happening on the City Council. And the, the, uh, the issue that I get the most questions on is, of course, retail cannabis coming to our city. And so I'm very fortunate. Councilor at large, Winthrop Farwell, is here to speak on it. And I will also chime in. Finally, here it is, that snow emergency time of year. So later on, I expect the executive director of our Brockton Emergency Management to stop by, Steve Hook. He's just a great guy. Since I've been doing this city councilor job, he has been such a wonderful problem solver and troubleshooter with me and for me in Ward 4. So I'm really looking forward to you hearing him. So at this time, I'm going to ask Captain Mark Picaro to come up and talk crime with us. Hey, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Picaro. I'm a captain with the Brockton Police Department. 
and my position there is I'm the patrol division commander, and I oversee all three patrol shifts. Uh, the counselor asked me to come here tonight to address the Ward 4 crime statistics, the end of the year crime stats for 2018. <clears throat> Compiling those numbers are a bit of a Herculean task. The chief's administrative assistant did a pretty good job of coming up with the numbers for me. And the way our computer is designed, I'm told, is we essentially have to go street by street by street to come up with these numbers. That would be uh, almost an impossible task. So what has been given to me is a list of the major streets in Ward 4 and the number of instances that you know there was crime or, or police involvement on those streets. And what I did is I just came up with a general, a, you know, a total number for 2018. And so that, you know, the streets that were given to me were Carl Ave, Copeland Street, Grove Street, Main Street, Montello Street, Perkins Ave, and Summer Street. The instances on these streets encompass anything from assault and batteries to credit card fraud to stolen motor vehicles to family disturbances to drugs to murders. You name it, if we went to it, it was given to me. And I tallied up the numbers for all of these streets. And for 2018, in Ward 4, the Brockton Police responded 707 times to those major streets in your ward. Um, I don't have comparison numbers to compare it to wards 3, 2, or 1 to tell you how you're doing in comp you know, comparison to other wards. But when I look at that number, it doesn't strike me as an unusually large number. A lot of Ward 4 is in what we call our Southeast sector. The Southeast sector historically has not been a very busy sector for us, so you can take peace with that fact that um, you live in a relatively quiet part of the city. <clears throat> the, uh, one of the numbers that uh, struck me is assaults. Out of 707 times that we responded to anything in those major streets, we had 113 reports of assaults, 58 larcenies, things that you may be interested in. And the one thing that I, uh, I picked out that you'd be particularly interested in, out of 700, about 700 times, 21 instances of drug violations. Not a lot when you think about it for Ward 4, 21 times that we were involved. So uh, I think that's a good number when you look at that. But that's basically your 2018 total doesn't seem to be too bad to me. The counselor had mentioned that you had some concerns. You may have reached out to her regarding Saturday night's events in the city. Um, you know, we've all read the news articles. We know what happened. Essentially, there was a, a, a cell phone store that was robbed Saturday night by four armed gunmen, not from Brockton. The police were called. The police got involved in tracking this vehicle. A car chase took place. The bad guys fired at the police officers. We continued to pursue, obviously, and we eventually captured three of them that night within a very short time frame. The fourth is still at large, but we know who it is, so. Um, it's concerning, I'm sure, on your part, you know, your, your neighborhoods, there was police helicopters and canines and police officers everywhere. Obviously, obviously, it's a big deal. But believe me when I tell you, you are very well served by the Brockton Police Department. What happened Saturday night and the result, no one was injured, no police officer was injured, thank God. Three out of four suspects were captured, a fourth was identified, firearms were recovered. Um, it was a spectacular job by the Brockton Police. We had great assistance from the State Police, the Stoughton Police, East Bridgewater PD, West Bridgewater PD, the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department helped us out. I'm told even Massasoit helped us out. And if I'm missing out on another police department that was there, I apologize. It was a great mutual aid, multi-agency event. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that. If anybody has any questions on that or concerns, I'd be more than happy to take that. Sir. Yes. I think, and my wife <coughs> heard all this from my house. Sure. The shots, the high speed chase. Right. That a call would have gone out warning people in that area like they do if there's a missing 
elderly person with Alzheimer's or a missing kid, usually you get that call. Right. Didn't get anything, especially when you're chasing some guy down that's roaming through neighborhoods. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good idea. You know? The only thing I can say in defense of why maybe we didn't do it I that night. I understand day. you're busy. That's the thing, you know, the, the people on the scene, the supervisor, the lieutenant sergeant who were on the scene, obviously had their hands full. At, you know, gunmen out there, you know, they're, they're concerned for your safety, their safety, they want to capture these people. There was a sergeant back at the station by himself who did a fantastic job of coordinating everything on that end. Very busy too. Um, it probably, it, that is a very good idea. It's just something they're probably going to overlook. But, you know, I understand that. Something, you know, in the future that, do it that, in other instances. A yeah. missing person or a kid or an elderly person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just so people know what's going on in their neighborhood. Sure. If someone breaks in their house, um, yeah, you know. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Outstanding job, and you're right, it was amazing that nobody got hurt. Yeah. Okay, amazing. And I think you guys do a great job, but 25 police officers shot for the population of the city. I wish there was a way we could get away, get you guys some more police officers. But I do have two questions for you. Sure. First one is I saw the dogs. How many dogs does Brockton have? We have two canines. Do you think we could use more dogs? We could always use more, it yeah. wouldn't hurt. Because we have some councils here. Maybe we could get that into the budget. I know some police officers like dogs, right. and there's certain times in certain dangerous situations that it would be great for the police officer to have a dog. Right. So do you think we're in need of more dogs? Um, we could certainly use more dogs. Okay. But in a situation, say, you know, one of our two canines or both canines are unavailable, we would, like we did that night, we would call a mutual aid from either the state police or the sheriff's department or you know, a surrounding town that may have a canine on or an off-duty canine officer who's available to come in. So we always have access to a canine. Thank you, sir. More cops will be better. City's way short. Are there more questions, comments on this topic? Was the weapon uh, confiscated illegal? I don't know what the status of the firearms are, sir.
Florida School of the Community member, a current counselor at large who's going to speak on some of the things happening at the city council. Councilor at large, Jennifer Farwell. And um, also the fact that uh, question whether there were some were going to be downtown, a couple on West Chestnut Street for sure it seems like. But for the other four, are they going to be sprinkled geographically around the city, or that hasn't been determined yet? There will be eight licenses. It's based on a formula: twenty percent of the number of alcoholic beverage licenses, and there are about thirty-seven of them. So twenty percent of thirty-seven is seven plus rounded off. It's eight. Two of those licenses will automatically go to the medical dispensaries up on West Chestnut Street by state law. Uh, there will be two downtown in what's called the C4 district. And then in the C3 districts around the city, it's really going to be the free market system. Where does someone want to locate? What facility can they find that will be of sufficient size for them to open a shop, provide the kind of parking, by the kind of security and obviously not encroach upon neighborhoods. So it, it will be interesting to see where people want to locate. Um, I'm thinking some people will want to be on the outskirts of the city simply because many other towns have opted not to get into the retail business. So I'm sure there'll be a demand from West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater. Uh, Officer Healy and I were joking, uh, I think it was Officer Healy and I were joking a little earlier that the number of people in my age bracket who seem to have a certain affinity for marijuana is quite staggering. Uh, I never smoked it myself. Uh, only child 
a strict Yankee family, so I probably couldn't have stepped out on that if I wanted to. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it really, it, the demand for it is interesting. People I never would have thought are interested in, shall we say, uh, going in and making a purchase. So, uh, you know, God bless them. I don't care what they do in their homes, as long as they don't drive under the influence of, uh, of a drug. You know, enjoy yourself and uh, partake of the legalization process. Yes, sir. Uh, Judge Nuki and uh, local resident, uh, I keep reading in the newspaper about so many possible millions of dollars, or hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in from marijuana sales. Is that money going to help the taxpayer by keeping the uh, tax rate the way it is? The honest answer is, and unfortunately I'm one of those people that has to be honest, under Prop 2 and a half, you will always, almost always, see the taxes go up because you can raise and appropriate 2.5% over the prior year's level. So if we get revenue in from marijuana, I suspect that will be a portion to increased services and in education, public safety, libraries, but I, I don't see it as something that would allow us to lower the taxes. I think they're, depending upon the value of your house and depending upon what the prior year's levy is, it is it's going to go up. Uh, Dennis, go ahead. did, six opposed it, the other six didn't want to give the people the right to vote on whether we should have the right to have pot shops or not. Now, as a teacher, we got a big vote coming up, the distance from schools. I don't know how anybody can vote to have pot shops only 500 feet from schools. Now, I know Tom Wanahan wants them only, Tom, he wants them only 500 feet from schools, but I hope some of the counselors and we heard from Mr. Cruz the other day too, uh, the DA, saying about a lot of different things. Fortunately, three of the five people on the ordinance committee voted not to. Uh, I hope we can keep these things a thousand feet from the kids. I'm hoping. And if not, maybe we can make a compromise of 750 feet. But we have a lot of people now that are very appalled and very upset with the people who didn't give us the right to vote. I'm hoping that, and it, it, there is a vote coming up on the city council on this too soon, is am I correct? Whether it will go 500 feet, 750, or 1,000. So I just hope that the city council comes to some common sense and keep these things away from the schools. Thank you. Just to expand on that a little bit, the, the current regulation would be 500 feet. Someone could offer an amendment to make it 750 or 1,000. I don't think the votes are there. And the other interesting thing is that I have not had one phone call from a principal, a teacher, uh, not to put the school committee on the spot, but I haven't heard from any school committee members about concerns of, as to whether 500, 750, or 1,000. There just doesn't seem to be a groundswell of interest to get involved in that debate over how far should it be from a public school. And it's interesting to me because I, I was in favor of a thousand feet. That's what they have in Colorado. That's what they have in the state of Washington. But, you know, it's almost like grass has been accepted. It, it's, it's here. It's no big deal. And people seem very comfortable with it. And so, you know, one of the difficult things is that all of us, we represent you. It's not what I want, it's not what I think should be done, it's what do the people who elect us want done. And if the will of the people is that they want to try it at 500 feet, see how it works out, see what effect it has on the city and the schools, then I have to represent that point of view and, and vote accordingly. It's, it's really not up to me to substitute my judgment for yours uh, unless I have information that you don't have. 
we've all debated this distance from schools, and uh, it is what it is. So I, I would suspect it's going to stay where it is. Uh, but I will say that if we find something is not working out, as elected officials, I think we should always step in and then try to change it. I don't think you just adopt a regulation or a zoning ordinance and then say, yeah, we'll never visit that again. I think you have to constantly step up and take a look at how it's working and then adjust what you're doing accordingly. Yes, sir. Ron Peck at Ward 4. When are these supposed to open? Is it all at once or one at a time? Oh, no, I think, I think it will take them a while to get through the Cannabis Control Commission. It's a very, very lengthy uh, and very detailed process. I mean, you go through a background check, you go through criminal checks, your finances are scrutinized, your security plan, the number of people you're going to have on duty, size of your operation, how many people will be employed, uh, what measures do you have to prevent people under 21 from coming in. So. If you would ask me, I would guess if we saw one open by May 1st, uh, June 1st, that might be aggressive, but it could happen. And then we'll get a better handle on revenues and what effect it has on the city. Now, how many were they looking to put in <coughs> when this came up, the licenses opened up? Well, there were always going to be a minimum eight. That's <coughs> that minimum? Yeah, there's always going to be a minimum eight. I, I would hope that we would stay at eight and then see how it works out. Yeah. I, did have some I heard from data. someone that the mayor wanted almost double that. Well, some of the, some of the people that called me who are very much pro-marijuana, they said that they wanted something like 40. And I was thinking to myself, that's ridiculous. I mean, that, you know, what are we going to do, have one for every Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's up his alley anyway. Talk but, about the grow places. The grow places. The, the grow places. Yeah. Fill me in now. Well, grow, you know, it's... Cultivation. Cultivation. Yes, yeah. Uh, we certainly will have some cultivation sites. There is a meeting tomorrow night at the Asheville School at 6.30. There is a proponent who would like to take an old factory up in Wood 6 and convert it into a grow factory. Uh, you know, provided that the building is, is satisfactory and there's no fire hazard, uh, that could be a possibility. That will again be more revenue. It'll be a host community agreement. For the first five years of the operation of a, of a facility, the city can have a host community agreement. We get five, a three percent of the revenues, the annual revenues. And after five years, that goes away, and then we just get three percent taxes and then whatever taxation the state decides they're going to distribute. So, uh, but you know, we're all in a guessing game right now. It's kind of interesting. It's brand new to Massachusetts. Granted, some have opened up already, but uh, until you have a couple of years under your belt and you know exactly what kind of revenues are coming in and how consistently those revenues come in monthly, I don't think we're going to have a handle on how beneficial it's going to be. And the cost of the impact. Yes, and the, and the social impact costs. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're we going to have to have the police go down and direct traffic around some highly uh, favorable location. I don't know. It's happened in other communities. I don't want the police tied up directing traffic. I think, uh, if anything, we ought to probably have an ordinance that mandates that if the chief determines that someone has to have traffic control around their retail establishment, then it should be paid for by the licensee. It shouldn't be paid for by the tax yes, yes, sir. Yeah, Bernie Anderson. Um, have you seen uh, the article that was in the New York Times which talked about uh, the, I'll give you the title of it, <coughs> uh, what advocates of legalized pot don't want you to know. And it, and it talks about the adverse uh, effects of people who smoke pot. Um, talks about the implications of that to the community. Talks about um, <coughs> increasing paranoia and psychosis uh, that is closely Everybody related to early? violence. Thank you, sir. Um, <coughs> so this article that was in the, in the uh, New York Times talks about uh, marijuana can cause paranoia and psychosis, uh, conditions closely linked to violence, um, and, and I'm just 
to cut out a couple of comments uh, from the whole article. But the first four states to legalize uh, Alaska, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington have seen sharp increases in murders and aggravated, aggravated assaults since 2014, according to the reports from the FBI. Uh, police reports and news articles show a clear link to cannabis in many cases. So <clears throat> I think that there is going to be uh, repercussions as a result of this, not just people driving under the influence, but I think way beyond that. When you look at the hazards, it, this, is, this is worse than smoking cigarettes. And this is the untold truth that exists out there. Um, people that, that utilize marijuana are more likely to go on to opioids. Uh, there is so much data that's out there, and yet everybody thinks that this is a safe drug. The, the THC content that was in marijuana in 1970 was 5%. The THC content in marijuana now is 25%. Yeah. Okay? This is not a good thing for our community at all. And I realize, okay, you're going with it because the voters voted for it. The voters are foolish. The people that want to use it, I think, are very foolish. But I think this is going to have a, a severe um, repercussions on the city of Brockton in the long run. I think it's going to be costly. You talk about new revenue that's coming in. We're going to spend so much money uh, addressing all of the issues that this creates that there's going to be no new revenue in the bottom line. So that's, you know, again, I'll, I'll be glad to send you this article if you want to give me an email or anybody else. Well. The, the other thing that we, we need to be clear about is we're not just talking about the, the substance itself. We're talking about marijuana brownies, marijuana cookies, marijuana milkshakes, marijuana gummy, bear, gummy bears. There are a whole host of products that some of us are concerned will get into the hands of children. And we've already had some incidents in the schools where a kid has gotten hold of something from out of state and has gotten sick and they've had to send the kid to the nurse. And in a couple of cases, I believe Superintendent Smith said they actually had to send the kid to the hospital because they were chewing down on things that had marijuana in them. So it's, you know, for those of us in public office, um, somebody buys a half an ounce or an ounce of marijuana and goes home and smokes it, you know what, I'm okay with that. But somebody that buys all of these other products and perhaps gives them out inappropriately. And let's face it, kids do get some alcohol. Uh, so could they get some marijuana products? Yeah, they probably could. So that's why I think we have to be very vigilant to watch this industry as it grows in, in Brockton and in Massachusetts. And hopefully, uh, as this gentleman said, maybe more people will take a look at it. And maybe it'll be a fad for the first two or three years, and then it won't be a big deal. I don't we're shooting blind now. We, we honestly do not know all of the net effects that it will have on the city of Brockton, the social costs. Um, you know, I would suspect, I'm not a doctor, but smoking marijuana probably is just as bad for your lungs as tobacco. So, uh, you know, I hope we don't have a lot of issues with that. But uh, anyway, we're going to do the best we can. We'll monitor it. We've got a great police department. They'll keep tabs on it. And we'll keep you informed. How much revenue did the uh, medical facility give to the city this year? I, I do not know. We don't get those reports. I, it's certainly something we should ask for. I, I'd like to see that, a quarterly report. Who gets those reports? Uh, I, I'm going to guess that the deposits are made with the collective treasurer, and they must have a record of it. So. I mean, the city council should get that. That's uh, revenue that the city gets. $30 million last year. Right okay. in? services go to a large chunk of the, the um, I'm sorry, the donation that they make, that's part of their contract. It's not like taxing, where you know you go into the store and you, you know, get 6% or something, and then uh, it's, it's a contract with the city that all medical marijuana uh, situations have to make with the community that they're in doing the business. 
and then from there, it's a variable certainly, but they make contributions throughout the year to various programs, and it is recorded. I mean, you can get that information. But I can, for example, I know that some money has gone to the Boys and Girls Clubs for several of their programs, and to, um, I'm sorry, the um, Champion Program to address opioid addiction. I can tell you that those two on account. We, we do not receive any kind of, uh, what's I gonna say, report, or, uh, you know, uh, that what I say, spreadsheet, but this is, this happens throughout the year, and a lot of times you'll see it in the paper that a contribution was made through, in this case we'll say in good health, because right now that has been functioning for over three years now here in Brockton. The uh, other medical facility has not completely um, opened its doors yet because it's still under construction. But that, it's a very different than where you would see a tax if you were to go and buy a little bit of marijuana for yourself in a store and it will be listed and then, you know, that will be reported. So, hope that helps a little. So the recreational will be coming yeah. in as income for the city? Yes, I mean. It's different than that? Yes, they'll, they'll have to report it differently. But, but information sharing is something that Council President Moises Rodriguez is, is very big on, and I know he's communicated with the mayor on a whole host of topics. Give us more rather than less. I, I'd rather have, I'd rather get inundated with information and then I can extract what I don't really need or what I find is not that useful, but at least we'll know exactly what's going on because the, the revenue from the retail sales of marijuana products versus the costs of implementing that and policing it and holding the licensees accountable. I mean, you, you've, got to, you've got to weigh those, see if it's really helping you out. Lady Manette. Massachusetts, they, uh, that was a part of the procedure and policy. It's been rather advantageous for several programs, and they weren't, they weren't sure you know, where their money was going to be and how it was going to work out. Because remember, this is all medical. It's not a uh, situation. And I see what you're saying about CBS, but that is a whole you know, different dynamic. And um, I don't know if they used another template from another um, state that had already passed it, but I remember this going through and in each step of the way how they, they were handling it. And uh, there are ways you, know, you can go online and find out how it's broken down. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anything else before we leave marijuana here? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. There seems to be a mystery. Yeah, push it up. There seems to be a great mystery, great mystery going on in the city. And I don't know why the city council hasn't addressed it. And I'm going to ask you when you are going to address this. Okay. The Russell Lowe's case. He won in front of the MCAD. He won in a court of law. And we won't pay the guy. And now we find out that there could possibly be 40 more cases of discriminatory, unfair labor practices against the city. Now, even if 10 of those, we don't know if those 40 are gonna stand or not, but probably all 40 wouldn't stand. But even if 10 of them stand, how in the heck is the city gonna pay for that? And how in the heck did we get to that point of so many discriminatory, unfair labor practices. It, it's it's mind-boggling. It really, really is. So my question is, when is the city council going to have Mr. Revenants around in front to address it? And how long are we going to keep paying these outside law firms? We don't have that money. And how are we going to pay them? This could send the city into receivership or, or massive layoffs on the units. I mean, just, just by way of summary, if, if someone's not aware, the Lowe's case is a 
jury verdict of about $4.1 million against the city for alleged retaliation and discrimination in hiring. Um, I suspect we would have to borrow that money if we do have to pay it. I think it's going through the appeals process, which is expensive. I do agree the city council needs to get a handle on what are we spending for outside council and how long is this going to go on because, you know, if, if with all due respect to attorneys, uh, once they handle a case, it, it can, you know, take on a life of its own because you've got discovery, you've got people to interview, you've got filings, you've got all sorts of things, and meanwhile the taxpayers are on the hook for the bill. So I would think, uh, and I'm not going to put uh, council president on the hook for an answer, but I would think that in the next two or three months we need to have a discussion with the city solicitor as to what's going on with that case, what are we appealing, what is it costing us, and what is the end What's our end game plan? I mean, if our end game plan is that we're going to have to pay it, then we've got to figure out how to do that. If they really think we can win, um, I'd like to hear it. But all of that is legitimate questions for those of us on the council to get a handle on city finances. How far back do these cases go? Uh, back into Mayor Balzotti's term, so at least five years. Six years. 2014, 2013. There's like 40 of these cases? Well, it is, it's been a, there's a trial that's coming up in June to determine if there's a class action uh, situation here where there's more than one person who might qualify for, for a trial on damages. And then, I mean, that's, that's what we need to get a handle on, is what's well, going on. are under the present mayor. I'm told that there are as many as 12 that have, that have been instituted during the Carpenter administration as well. So it's unfortunately been a continuing thing. Let's, let's give um, Councillor Farwell a round of applause. Thank you so much. So informative as always. We let him take the hard questions, those of us here this evening. And before we go any further, I want to say, Brockton Community Access does a yeoman's job at helping the council, city hall, um, communicate our meetings and, and cover our meetings. And this evening, Aaron Tebow is here from Brockton and Community Access. Please give him a round of applause. I'm so grateful to them for, um, for uh, broadcasting and recording my 10-minute Facts on Four show and also for all these meetings that they cover, including city council and finance. And I'd also like to say to you, council, the city council works very hard and takes very seriously all of your issues. We represent all of you. You've got to call us if you've got questions and concerns. In Ward 4, you can call me at 508-941-0108. Call me anytime. I've got an answering machine. Um, I do return phone calls, mostly promptly, unless I'm not, not around. Um, my final speaker, Steve Hook, is not here yet, so I'd like to ask someone in the audience to come up. You know, we're talking this evening about city issues. We need to be better connected together. We need neighborhood associations. When I first moved to Brockton, I met all my neighbors by being involved in my crime watch. And it was great. We met every three months, and I went as much for the glasses of wine as I did for, um, for the communication, but I really learned so much about my neighborhood by being in a crime watch. And so in the city, again, we're asking people to create neighborhood associations. And our favorite Ward 4 activist is going to start holding a class on this. I'd like to present Lynn Smith. Hi everybody. So the first thing I'm going to say is look around you. Look around at another table. Look around you. Do you see someone that you never saw before, that you never met before? A new face? Stand up and say hello. Stand up, find somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself. Give, you, 
bums a little chance to rest from these uh, mushroom chairs, too. Find someone you don't know and say hello. It was filled with sand and concrete. But a bunch of us started to pay attention to the park, and we started to pick it up, and we started to clean it, and we started to have an Easter egg hunt there, and then we had an outdoor movie there, and then we had a Flag Day picnic there. And lo and behold, some state money became available to rebuild parks, and lo and behold, George Keith Park went first on the list, and lo and behold, $333,000 became available, and lo and behold, after a lot of community meetings and a lot of residents getting involved, that George Keith Fountain worked for the first time in 37 years. So that's the power of community. So if you've heard of the George, uh, the Keith Park Neighborhood Association, or if you've heard of the Douglas Neighborhood Association, we're the folks that brought you the George Keith Fountain, we're the folks that brought you the little free libraries, we're the folks that brought you the outdoor movies. So what I'm doing now is trying to recreate that experience by joining communities and neighbors together. You know, we talked a little bit about the um, activity last Saturday night. Well, I live at 34 Car Lab. And guess what 34 Car Lab faces? Bristol Ave. And guess where the car was ditched? On my front lawn. Not on my lawn, but in front of my house. So I had a front row seat to all of the police cars, all of the long guns, all of the canines, the helicopter. It all happened outside of my house. But you know the first thing that happened? My neighbors started to call me. I started to call them. We started to text each other. Are you OK? What's going on? Stay away from the windows. Be safe. Stay in touch with each other. Because on Kalev, we know each other. So what the Resident Leader Training Program is, we call it Team Brockton RLP, and it's gonna teach folks how to get together as a neighborhood group to speak in one voice and effect change in the community. Very simple things like how to run a meeting, very simple things, how to set up an agenda, very simple things, how do you get a bank account if you wanna take donations for events? Very simple things. What about liability? What if you have an event in a park and somebody falls down and breaks a leg? Very simple things like how to write operating principles so if you ever want to be a 501c3, you can set up a way to be a nonprofit. So we do six classes once a month from February through June. The program is free. It's going to be Thursday nights at the East Branch of the library. We have a website. Now, I'm too cheap to pay for a website, so there's this company called Weebly. Have you ever heard of Weebly? W-E-E-B-L-Y. You can have a free we uh, website. So we have a website, teambrockdenrlp.weebly.com. Or you can go on Facebook and go to the Keith Park Neighborhood Association, and all of the information is there. So if you don't want to start your own neighborhood association and you'd like to join the folks at the Keith Park Neighborhood Association, you can. Or if you'd like to start one in your neighborhood, just give me a call, 774-381-8050, or go on any one of the Facebook pages or the website, and you can shoot me a messenger. The program is free. And one of the interesting things is we convince the city as an incentive to make available mini grants. So there are $500 mini grants available to these new neighborhood associations. 
but they have to learn how to fill out the application, they have to learn how to ask, they have to learn how to document, and they have to prove that their event or their program was a success. So I thank Susan for this opportunity to talk about resident leader training. And if I can just take one minute um, to talk about BEMA, the Brockton Emergency Management Agency, and Steve Hook, and what he does. You know, even like today, I think there's a two hour delay in school tomorrow. Did I hear that correct? So what happens is they have a nerve center at the Brockton War Memorial Building, and they get everybody together. So they get building and highway and school and DPW and the police and the fire, and they all sit around and they say, okay, if we make this decision, how is it gonna affect the city? One hand has to know what the other hand is, is doing. And one of the things Steve has always taught me as an individual and all of us as residents, if there is a disaster, if there is an emergency, what's your plan? What's your plan? How are you going to get out safely? How are you going to let people know that you're safe? How are you going to connect with your family members later? Where are your meds? Where are your important papers? What's your plan? So every household needs to be ready. Every business needs to be ready. What your plan? The other thing is, part of emergency management is the Citizen Emergency Response Team, C-E-R-T. Anyone can take their classes. I have been trained in first aid. I have been trained on how to set up an emergency dispensary if we have to give out meds. I have been set up, trained on how to set up a shelter in case of a snowstorm or a tornado. I have been trained on how to go through debris to look for victims without killing myself. I have been trained in basic first aid. Remember the visions and the pictures that we saw of what happened in Florida when that storm went through? Do you know who the first responders are? People, neighbors. It's neighbors trying to find their neighbors. And so one of the things that BEMA and CERT does is teach us as citizens on how to be prepared and how to respond to help our neighbors. So it's part of what I do to teach people on how to be engaged with the city and how to be good neighbors to each other, just like we were on Carlev. And here is the man of the hour who's gonna be able to tell you more about, I just told them, Steve, about CERT. Okay. So I will turn Bima over to you. So thank you, Susan, for this minute. And this is Steve. This is Steve Hook, the Executive Director of Brockton Emergency Management. Good evening, everybody. I apologize for my uh, tidiness. We have a lot of stuff going on this evening. Uh, does everybody show of hands? Everybody heard of the Emergency Management Agency? Do you know what we do? So, we're the agency responsible for disaster recovery, mitigation, response. So, big stuff that happens in the city. We have a great fire department, a great police department. They handle the day-to-day -day stuff. We handle the stuff that, that's a larger scale where we need to, where our local resources are tapped and a lot of times we need to bring in state and federal resources. Such as the blizzards of 2015, where we had feet of snow. Luckily, we're not there this year. Uh, so far, it is snowing up there pretty good now. Um, the water main break in the summer, late spring, early summer of 2015, that was something that we had to bring in state resources for. So, we are a public, uh, we are obviously a city department, we're a part-time agency. Uh, we are also responsible for planning of these events. So my job, unfortunately, is to think of everything bad that could happen in the city and have a plan for it. We have a comprehensive emergency management plan, the big book, it's about this big. Uh, it's also in electronic form, but when something bad happens, it gives us some guidance 
We can't boilerplate every single emergency, but it does provide us some guidance. Uh, some of the other stuff that the emergency management agency is responsible for is emergency, emergency sheltering. So we have a power failure or a water main break or something where people can't live in their houses for some reason, we will open up an emergency shelter. We have several of them located throughout the city and we train on this stuff. Uh, community Emergency Response Team, CERT Team. Anybody hear of that? Yeah. Lynn just spoke of it. Oh, Lynn just spoke of it. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. So I'm sure Lynn told you how uh, we rely on volunteers. Uh, we have 100 plus volunteers uh, throughout the city that signed up to be part of the CERT Team. And we use these individuals throughout the year for different events. Sometimes it's for emergencies, sometimes it's for planned events. So uh, if we open up the Emergency Operations Center located at the War Memorial Building, which we often do in the winter for snowstorms. We will utilize uh, CERT volunteers to staff the EOC, answer the, the storm hotline as we call it, um, to name a couple of things. But we also, we also use the CERT team for scheduled events, holiday parades, um, you know, different events throughout the city, the DW Field Triathlon. Um, so I encourage everybody, if you're interested in signing up and volunteering for the CERT team, uh, there's an application on the city website. Just click on BEMA, click on CERT, download the application, set it in. We'd love to have you. Uh, there's no requirements. We'll train you. We're not going to make you do anything that you don't want to do. Sometimes we go into the field. Uh, to search for missing people. Uh, if you're not comfortable with that, that's not something that, that we're going to make you do. But it's nice to have a team of people that can help neighbors in the city in a time of need, a disaster. Um, snow emergencies, we'll talk about snow emergencies since we're in the season. Snow emergencies uh, is when there's a parking band in the city. No parking on any city street. So I just want to, I know a lot of people uh, get upset when we declare a snow emergency and we say we can't, you can't park on the street, you gotta use the city lot or the parking garage. So those decisions don't come easy. So, uh, the way it happens is if we think we're gonna have a storm, uh, myself, the mayor, DPW commissioner, we get together, we look at the forecast, and we make a decision based on public safety. We need to get fire apparatus, ambulances, and police cruisers down streets uh, during snow. We need to, you know, we have two, we have three hospitals, but two emergency uh, room hospitals in the city. We need to keep access to them open. And we understand that it disrupts neighbors and uh, businesses, but we, we need to, we do that for public safety so we can get those apparatus and cruises down the street when we need to. Uh, on another note, and I spoke at the Business Association meeting, Campella Business Association meeting uh, yesterday, and one of the things I preach to them is have a plan. Have a plan when there's a disaster. What, what is your plan, your home plan? Where are you going to go if you need to leave your house? Who are you going to communicate? What happens if the cell phone towers don't work? What's your communication plan? What happens if there's no power for days? How are you going to handle that? One of the calls that we get in the emergency management agency a lot, especially during snowstorms, is people running out of oil. Have a plan. We know there's a storm coming. You know, maybe get a delivery of oil just before the storm. Um, we try to help everybody we can in those situations. Sometimes we can't get an oil truck out in the middle of a blizzard to, to deliver oil. It's difficult. But those type of situations, we do try to help residents as best as we can. Um, so you can always call the emergency management agency if you have a question about a storm, a parking ban, uh, or something like that. We'll be happy to answer it and handle it the best that we can. I ran through a lot in a short time.
Do you, anybody have any questions? questions? Come on, somebody's got to have a question. Sir? Would you guys ever be involved if we had a crazy mass shooting? Yes. Could you explain what you might do then? Can I explain what? Some of what your role would be. So again, uh, in a mass shooting, God forbid something bad happens, and we, we do train for this stuff. We had a, uh, an exercise with the police, fire department, EMS, some other department heads uh, about a year ago, um, a tabletop exercise, and then we had a, um, an exercise in the field. So we would, you know, this is a police department function, um, but we will support police and fire with resources, out-of-town out of resources, out-of-state uh, resources, and federal resources if necessary. That would be our role. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I've heard it all. Sir? Uh, in September, we had bad fire on Kennedy Street. The pulled up. In, in September, we had a very bad fire on Kendall Street, and a food truck pulled up. Was that yours? Was that being a food truck to help the fire? And they, they found the police officers were there. Was that yours? I, I wish it was. No, uh, we. That is a volunteer organization. Uh, they either come out of Boston or Providence. Again, the truck is donated by a company typically, uh, and they supply the food and the stuff for firefighters. We will typically do fire rehab. You know, during a big fire, we'll bring out, we have some, you know, obviously water, but we have some misting fans and some, uh, some you know, cold towels and stuff that we can, we can bring as a first response to that. But, okay, thank you. Thank you. You have, you said, three shelters in Brockton. The Wall Memorial Building, is there one of the north side and south side too? So we have a number of shelters, or buildings that can be used as shelters if we need to. The Wall Memorial is not a shelter. It's the Emergency Operations Center. The first shelter that we would go to is the unknown school. Um, but we have a number of, the high school could be used as a shelter. Um, a, a lot of the newer schools, because they had generators to use the shelters, so. Now these shelters, were they fine and was the EMT be stationed here as well as a police officer? There will, be a, there will be a police officer and an EMT station there any time we open a shelter. Okay, thank you very much. A lot goes into a shelter. Uh, there's a lot of resources that are brought in. The Red Cross is brought in. Uh, we, we have people on our CERT team. We have to, you know, we're mandated by law that you can bring your pets to shelters now. So we have to, uh, we have to plan for that. And we bring people in to care for those pets. We have a whole pet ID system. When you bring your pet in, your pet gets a, a ban, you get a ban, we take a picture of you and your pet. We put it in a cage. Uh, you guys can walk, you know, the owners can, can handle the pets in a specific area of the shelter. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into that. Ma'am. Can, can you just tell everyone what this no emergency line is? I think a lot of people don't know what it is. Sure. So the snow hotline or emergency line is the emergency management agency main number, 508-580-7871. And that can be found on the city website. Uh, also, we do a lot of social media uh, during emergencies. If you have Facebook or Twitter, you can follow us on there. That is the most timely information uh, that we have. We also have a reverse 911 system in the city called Code Red that um, you know we can send a, a, a voice message out to landline telephones. It doesn't go to your cell phone unless you specifically sign up. Okay, so if you, if you want to be, receive those code red messages or those reverse 911 messages on your cell phone, you have to specifically sign up for that. You'll get them at your home, you'll get them at your business, but you won't get them on your cell phone unless you sign up. And you can also find that on the city website uh, under the Emergency Management Agency, how to sign up. Sir? Good evening. Okay. 
Yeah, so the question was whether or not during snow emergencies and other emergencies can we display something on the television screen. So the answer to that is yes. Um, during snow emergencies, we typically send those messages out on the local channels, 9 and 12. And we'll, the, the BCA will put a scroll on there or they'll put a, a solid screen on there with information. During an emergency like the uh, something larger, like the, the water main break or if we had to evacuate the city for some reason, we could access and interrupt programming on your television. That has to be done at the state level. They don't give us access to that. That has to be done at the state level. The, also, the other thing we can do is activate your cell phones. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen those messages come across your cell phone, tornado warning, or uh, there was a test recently that went out. We can also access that. There's a service called, uh, an app called WPS Wireless Priority Service. You can download it from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and you can also get those messages. Anything else? You guys are easy. <laughs> Sir? Hey, uh, what do they do on a snowstorm when the uh, cars are still parked on the street and they're supposed to be, you know, in a parking garage? What do you do if the cars are still there? It's a good question. So, I want to tell you what happens a little bit on a snowstorms. I told you the mayor and I and the DPW commission to meet, we decide we're going to declare a state of emergency. The mayor declares a state of emergency. We send the messages out, Facebook, Twitter, the, the, the BCA, emails. Uh, there's multiple next door. We use the next door app. Uh, we use the uh, C-Click Fix app to send those messages out. If we decide to open up the Emergency Management Agency, the, the uh, Emergency Operations Center at the Wall Memorial Building, we bring in every department head that has anything to do with public safety. Okay, and there's about 14 of us that sit around the table, myself, the fire chief, the police chief, the school superintendent, somebody from Brockton Housing, uh, the in property, Brockton property, building department, uh, council on Aging, uh, we bring a national grid, we bring in Columbia Gas, and we all sit around the table and we make decisions based on what's going to happen in the storm. In the Emergency Operations Center, we can get direct information from the National Weather Service, we're monitoring that information all the time, we can get information from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency as well. And we're continuously monitoring that information and making decisions collectively based on what we know. So to answer your specific question, um, when we do have a snow emergency, uh, there are teams of police department and DPW workers out, and they tow cops, basically. If you don't move your cop, they tow. If it's deemed a hazard, they tow. And they don't, it's not, we don't like to tow. We try to give the owners an opportunity. I know the cruisers go out and they, they hit their sirens or maybe bang on some doors to get people to move their cars. But it's imperative, especially the first couple of snowstorms, that we push the snow far, far enough back to the street so when we get additional snowstorms, we we'll keep pushing the snow back. Okay, in the first couple of snowstorms, it's very important to move those cars so we can push the snow back. But if there's a snow emergency and it's deemed a hazard and they can't plow the street, they're going to tow your car. Now, can we tow every single car in the city? Probably not, but there are hundreds that get towed. You better check the end of Grove Avenue. We get a lot of calls during storms that there are cars parked on the street. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Sure. The other thing is, that, can any of you use C-Click Fix? You know, that's the program that if you want to report a pothole or you want to report debris or an ordinance problem. The city right now is negotiating with C-Click Fix. With C-Click Fix, right now we, we can put a complaint or a suggestion on the site but the only response we get is, oh, we'll look into it. Well, there's a thing called push messages, push, 
so that if you have signed up, if you're a member of C-Click Fix and they have your email address, when there is a problem, when there is a crisis, when there is delayed trash, they can send a push message out to all of the emails on file. So that's coming, watch for it, that's coming soon. It's already here. It's already here. See, they're so fast, I missed it. So we do, do send messages through C Click Fix and it does go to email and it also goes to the app as an alert. So you'll see that on your, uh, on your app. No squall warning. Any other questions? I brought some pens and some flashlights and some information on making a home uh, plan and a home kit that you can take with you. Um, and I encourage everybody to have a plan in an emergency. If you need to leave your house, we have no power for three days. Have a plan. Um, or any type of, how you're going to get a hold of family members if the, the cell service goes down or the phone system goes down. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, you can always call the Emergency Management Agency. We try to answer the phone 24-7. Uh, we always have somebody that is the duty officer that's on call uh, to handle questions or responses. So um, thank you again, and uh, feel free to call anytime. Thank you. So who's got a question that we didn't cover this evening? Mike. Mike, I'd, I'd just like you to grab the microphone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Hi, this question is for uh, Captain uh, Picaro. Uh, 2018, you had a quality of life task force. Will there be, uh, is that force still around for 2019? Yes, the Quality of Life Task Force is something that's run out of City Hall. It's headed by the mayor, and they meet once a week over in City Hall, different department heads. They meet every Thursday, I believe it is, Thursday morning, and uh, discuss issues and try to resolve problems. But uh, that's, that's still in existence, and as far as I'm aware, it's going to continue. Okay, uh, my second question is, um, last year, uh, I watched on TV, there was a meeting where uh, it was brought up about possibly having a sound meter uh, in some of the police cruisers to um, check on uh, the volume of parties and everything. Right. Uh, is, is that in effect as far as this year, or is that, um, is, is that going to happen? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it will. That was brought up at the Finance Committee meeting back in August, I believe. I was there along with Chief Crowley. Right. It was discussed. Um, I don't know where it's at right now, and, but uh, hopefully that's something that will be coming. All right. Uh, my third question is um, illegal bars. Illegal what? Illegal bars. Bars, yes. You know, party after, like, 11 o'clock to 4, 35 o'clock in the morning where the people show up not bringing any booze or anything, but yet when they come out of the house, they have, you know, they have, uh, they have alcohol, and they don't care about the neighbors, and uh, they just uh, have at it when you call the police. The police only go to the front, they drive by, they don't hear the noise that's uh, it's actually in the back, uh, in the backyard. Uh, my question as far as on, I say, the illegal bars, uh, loud parties, and uh, the disturbances, what, um, will there be fines? Will these parties be shut down? And you have some people who will have, try to hold, basically it's a commercial event in a residential area. That is, is that, that is illegal, is it not? It is, and we had a few of them last summer. That was yes. my first summer as the patrol commander. Um, I think we made progress with the problem that's been going on for quite some time now. Yes. It, like I said, that was my first summer trying to get a handle yes. on a very big yes. issue. Right. It's a work in progress. I think we did a pretty good job yes. last year. I would like to see improvement this summer. I think I'd like to get ahead of it. Right. And uh, you know, my, uh, my last question is, when you, when you call as far as the police, 
Should they come to your house before they go to this uh, disturbance? Because, like I said, sometimes like, you don't see the cruises. I, I realize some of them it is uh, the priority as far as the uh, other crime that's happening in the city. But I mean, sometimes you don't you don't uh, you don't know if the cruiser has gone to the place, and uh, you know you, you have no no. I mean, a lot of times if the cruiser comes to the house, then, then they will. They know uh, for a fact as far as what's going on. Then they can go over and uh, tell somebody, hey, party's over, that's it. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's ridiculous as far as what uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the neighbors and everything, what they have to go through. Yeah. Just for you know, they have, uh, people, they want everybody to be neighbors, but how can you be neighbors if somebody who has no consideration as far as for what, um, what is happening? You know, right. Right. Uh, uh, that's well, right. right. Houses. Yeah, I agree. As far as it's coming to your house, that's completely up to you, the caller. A lot, I don't want to say a lot, but many of the calls we receive regarding issues with a neighbor, the caller refuses to identify him or herself for the obvious reason. So we don't know who's calling. So they'll just, we'll receive a call from somebody saying that there's a problem at number 123 Main Street refuse to call it loud party. Right. So when the cruiser eventually gets there, they could be right away if there's no calls, it might be an hour or two if we're, if we're straight out. Might be might be all night if we had another situation like we did set in. Sure. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's the roll of the dice no, when we no, get I, there. I, but I understand that, but like when you call and talk with the, the dispatcher, they'll say, where is the disturbance? And then uh, you know, I'll say, well, can the cruiser come to the house? No, we're sending as far as to where the disturbance is. Okay, so then, you know, uh, it's, you know, what I, you don't know if, if the cruiser has shown up or not. Mm -hmm. uh, no, if, if you, it's not unreasonable. If you call and say that you have a, a, a particular issue with a house, but you'd like the officer to come and talk to you first, that's that's completely up to you. The ball's in your court if you want to do that, if you want the police. Now, do you have a sound meter? As far as it, it, would that, could that be used as far as, like, if, uh, say, as far as, uh, the people who have, like, these pies or stuff, yeah. And say if they get fined, they go to court. They they will um, extra uh, ask for uh, like an extension and all, and all that. And then by the second or third time, when they sir, can court, you use the microphone, please? So when uh, after two or three extensions from from going to court, the judge throws it out and he said, "Well, we don't have to. It's just a lot of party." I mean, but if you had um, a reading as far as from the sound meter, would that um, that, that would put them they start that fall where they'd have to pay that fine right then and there, correct? I can't speak for what the court may or may not do if we had sound meters. Um, they don't necessarily throw things out. Um, you know, if, if we had these meters and had proper training on them, I would have, I've never used a sound meter before. I wouldn't know what one looks like, but I would imagine there's some way that if I go to a particular house, put the meter on it, it'll record. The, the reading and maybe that could be taken to court or at least noted in the police report that the sound meter recorded at whatever decibel level and we, you know, we could use that as evidence in court, but, uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Someone else had a question. Yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Captain, I know, this, I know there's a, number, a hotline number that people, people can report illegal activities such as drugs or stolen cars without being named, because a lot of people are free of retaliation by these criminals. Right. What, what is that number? You, you can call that business number and not give your identity. The 0200 number? The 0200 okay. number. I think, and don't quote me, I think I think there's like some sort of a crime tip line. It could be 508-941-0244. But double check before you call. Okay. I think it's like 244 on the end. Because a lot of people are afraid of retaliation. Yeah, if you call the business line, you can, it happens all the time. It could be happening right now as we speak. People call us and they refuse to give their name, address, phone number, and that's how it gets put in, refuse call up. No. 
Hi, yes, John Graham. Hi, John. Uh, this is it's a, just a comment to you, uh, Linda. I mean, Susan, sorry. I want to thank you for your hard work uh, during this past year with my neighborhood and uh, things you've done for us personally down on our little dead end cul-de-sac, which nobody ever really knows about down there. And um, Captain, I want to commend you and your officers for um, stepping up the patrol in our neighborhood. Um, and maybe a little sidebar before we leave tonight. Sure. Um, it's, uh, things have changed a little. Um, and uh, I'd like to see them change a little more. And I'm sure you you remember my wife. She makes a lot of noise. She's a former corrections officer, so she's not afraid to make her voice known. But uh, things have changed, and I just want to say thank you to both. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Someone else. We're coming to the end of our time. But please, somebody else have a question or a comment? Uh, this goes with two loud parties. Is there a noise ordinance for the city, and where can you find it? Because I have looked on the City of Brockton website. I can find Boston's information, but I can't find anything for our own town. There, there is a noise ordinance. I found it last year. If you go to the, the city's webpage, you can search the ordinances online. And I, I think if you just put in noise ordinance, it should pop up. It should come up. I haven't had any luck so far. Like I said, I found Boston, but not Brockton. There is one. It's kind of hard to follow. Uh, Captain Bacar and I have talked about it quite a bit. I have a draft new, okay. or, new NORS ordinance to, to submit. It's very similar to the one in Newton, which is very thorough, covers everything. They're very against leaf blowers in Newton, by the way. <laughs> um, but anyway. I will be submitting it this year. It was suggested to me that I hang on to it until after we took care of our several cannabis ordinances, which we're nearly finished with them. So you'll be seeing something submitted this year. It will come into the council and then be referred to the ordinance committee, which will vet it out, perhaps make some changes and stuff, and then come back to the council, most likely. I thank you very much. Well, on behalf of all the city officials who've come this evening at my request, and, and myself, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your smart questions. Um, and please remember to be in touch with me with questions or comments, 508-941-0108. Yes. Oh, OK. And Mr. Duarte informs me that the police department hotline is 508 897-5244. Thank you very much. Good night.